everyone. Good morning. I'm happy to be the first session here. I'm going to need, um, Ignatius, I'm going to need um, screen sharing capability because I do have a presentation that I would like to share if that's okay. You should be able to share. Try it. Okay. okay, great. Um, so yeah, most of you all know that I am a free verse poet who uh, happened to be a haiku. I, I learned haiku from um, the great uh, Lenard D. Moore. And there's a, a bunch of us here in North Carolina who write haiku. Um, Teresa L. Tur Church, Gideon Young, um, Sheila McC uh, Smith McCoy, who is now subsequently in California. And then there's a host of other transplants that have come here. Um, so we have a nice uh, community here. But um, my fellowship, um, with Duke University involved a lot of research um, dealing with slavery and slavery artifacts and slavery documents and slavery uh, visits to uh, historically preserved plantations. And so <clears throat> the idea was to look at those documents, look at that work, encounter the work and uh, subsequently write a frastic, uh, haiku or write in response uh, to those things. So, I uh, went through that journey, which was, I would say, no light work. It was very difficult um, because of the subject matter, obviously, and the historical content. But um, I did uh, write and, and visit these places and write in response. And Ebbing Shore has just been released a couple of uh, months ago, and it's it's doing well. There's only 200 copies. It's a limited edition. So if you don't have a copy, I highly recommend you, <laughs> you order a copy. But all of the haiku uh, in there are written in response to um, either slavery plantation visits or uh, artifacts of slavery. So with further ado, I, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully I have everything up here I need. All right, please let me know if you can see that, everyone. Go back to the beginning there. Okay. So, and I call this achieving, let me go back really quickly. I don't know why it's not, uh, hold on one second, I'm having issues here. Uh, issues with the pages. Whoa, sorry guys. Let me go back to the beginning there. Okay. Okay. And I call this achieving um, ekphrastic haiku because um, often when we encounter a piece of art or a photograph or what, what have you, uh, we tend to record an image. We tend to record what we see. Sight, of course, is our dominant sense, and that's usually what we do. But um, to achieve, I think, a, a, a good uh, ekphrastic haiku, there has to be a, a lot more there. There has to be meaning. There has to be all the stuff that you want in haiku, tension, and sometimes, you know, that irony, and all of those things that that uh, make a, a decent haiku, you know, decent. And so that's the same sort of idea with the frastic haiku. It's very easy. And I just wanted that, that caveat I want to put out there. It's very easy just to record the image of, of what you're seeing. Um, but it's a little more involved than that. Okay, I'm trying to try to change my page here. <laughs> it's not being very happy with me. Okay, so yes, ekphrastic uh, poetry, and it's poetry as well. So poets who write free verse, who write in different forms, we write ekphrastic poetry. So it's not just um, obviously um, relational to haiku. I think the Iliad by Homer is one of, one of the most, uh, the greatest examples of ekphrastic poetry. But it's simply the verbal representation of a visual representation. That's basically all you're doing. And of course, um, the poet John Hollander, who wrote extensively on uh, ekphrastic haiku, basically says, and this was sort of when it first started, so 
it's not always been a, a form, it, but it's, you know, in a form that sort of everyone has adopted. It's, it's very sort of unique, much like haiku in that way. But um, when poets started to write about it um, more often and write in response to art more often, he wrote an article and in this article, um, he said, writing about art included, the new poet, the new ways of writing about art included addressing the image, making it speak, speaking of it interpretively, meditating upon the moment and so forth. So any of these things uh, can be a reason that you are responding to the art and can contextualize uh, your ekphrastic haiku. Try to move again. Okay, and so with ekphrasis, and obviously that's the Greek form of that word, um, you can respond to several things. It can be photographic, you can be responding to a piece of visual art, uh, artifacts much like I worked with at Duke and, and these artifacts were uh, you know, bills of sale sometimes of, of slaves. They were all kind of documentation that you can be responding to. Um, it could also be artifacts can um, expand out to uh, just things that are sort of preserved, right? Like a piece of jewelry that is no longer uh, put to use, but it's on display somewhere, that sort of thing. So any sort of artifact. Architecture as well. I have an example, obviously Ebbing Shore, I'll show you that a little later, is a response to a architectural piece, but architectural as, as, as well. Um, music, actually. If you are responding to a piece of music, that can also be ekphrasis. And then there's notional ekphrasis, which is a response to a dream. So we've, I've, I've attended a few presentations uh, at Haiku Society of America where, or, these, or this conference where people have actually talked about uh, writing haiku from dreams, but that is essentially notional ekphrasis. Okay, I have no idea why that did that. We've got to get that back the right way. Hold on one second. There we go. Okay, so why do we write ekphrastic haiku? What is the purpose of that? Haiku itself is, for me, difficult enough, responding to nature, um, looking for those aha moments, all of that thing. That's difficult enough. So why would we expand to sort of... Uh, include art or in, in, our, in our haiku. So obviously the poet seeks to meet the artist halfway, offering a creative response to the work. That's uh, the definition. But we wanna ask ourselves a few questions while we're, we're doing this. What is the relationship between the speaker of the ekphrasis and the work of art? Is it inquiry? Are we interested in the meaning of the art, what, what the artist intended. Um, do we sort of take issue with the art in, in terms that, you know, we disagree with, we disagree with the piece or we don't understand the piece? Is there a problem that the piece is presenting to us? Or is it that admiration, right? You, you look at it and you go, wow, this is just a, a wonderful piece of art. That could be for any reason. It could be because the piece of art speaks to you. It could also be because uh, of the aesthetics. It's just a beautiful piece of art. So you sort of ask, ask yourself those questions as you're responding to art. What was the poet provoked by, by this particular piece? So I will tell you, we have been invited. And when I say we is the Carolina African-American Writers Collective, and that is Lenard, myself, Gideon, Sheila Smith McCoy, all of us who indulge in haiku. And we have been invited many times to Duke National University to respond uh, to exhibits they have. They have wonderful exhibits. They have a director who actually is very focused on uh, African-American art, contemporary African-American artists, and really sort of uh, bringing art like that to Nasher and diversifying uh, the collection. So he's been collecting those pieces, but he also brings those exhibits uh, to Nasher. So of course, we, we would be asked to come as poets who are poets of color and respond. And it's very interesting when we do, who's drawn to what piece of art and why you're drawn to that piece of art. So 
when you go to a museum, you, you're obviously, you stop at one piece of art for maybe 10 seconds. And then you may go to another piece of art and you may stand there a while. And so why you're drawn to the piece of art is very, very important because that's going to really inform uh, your ekphrastic haiku or your ekphrastic poem. And then when we encounter the piece, right? Is it interrogation or is it interpretation or is it memory response? So interrogation, again, that speaks to the, the second uh, question there. Interrogation is really sort of finding meaning in it. Is that, is that the goal? Is that what we're trying to do? That's always the goal when we're in a museum, I think, is to try to find meaning into, with the art. I literally asked the director of Nasher um, a couple of months ago, I'm writing a grant, uh, so that we can sort of come up with a, a, a program where we're actually responding to art and, and come up with a book and all of that. So I'm writing a grant for that. But I asked him, I said, do you have descriptions of the pieces? And he says, they don't give them to me. And I thought that's crazy because you're the director. How are you going to write, uh, you know, some kind of marketing material? How are you going to do all of that if you don't have that? And he said, they, they, he said, that's what true artists do. They let you interpret the work. And so you take from the work what you want to. And he said, I do some research. I go back. I look at, you know, different pieces and, and topics and other things that they were working with. But that's, that's the way art works. So you have to think when you're, when you're encountering a piece, what is the true meaning? What is that? What are, what are they um, actually doing? So you, mostly you will be, unless it's, you know, if it's abstraction, whatever, you'll, you'll be doing an interrogation um, and an interpretation of the art. Um, and sometimes it's just a memory response, right? You, you look at the uh, piece, you encounter it and you go, hmm, this is conjuring a very interesting um, memory. And you record that memory based upon that. And the last issue that I think I, 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 I stri uh, struggled with a, a bit is how will the reader recognize the haiku as ekphrastic haiku? Or how will they recognize the piece of art, right? If, if the piece of art is not somehow identified in the haiku, if the title uh, or the name of the artist is not there, you're gonna need some sort of notation, right? Obviously, if you put Picasso in a haiku, we're gonna identify that as an acrostic haiku um, because of the name. If you put the titles, uh, what is it? Starry Nights or something like that, you're gonna identify that. If you don't have those things, say you're writing um, an acrostic that uh, conjures a memory, then you're gonna need some kind of notation. So you're gonna maybe say you're responding to, and this is outside of the haiku, you're responding to this piece of art. And I'll show you quickly an example of that. I don't know why my presentation has taken a life of its own. It's very strange. Oh, again. There we go. Okay, so this is uh, Norman Lewis's Afternoon, um, a very famous piece in African-American art. It was uh, created in 1969. And uh, I, I thought it was very interesting that when we encountered this, this piece as, as uh, poets at the National Museum, we all responded to it sort of in the same way, which I, I thought was interesting. Um, and this is El Teresa's Church's response, afternoon, we play hide and seek among the hollyhocks. And of course, placing afternoon in there uh, is helpful, but doesn't really, you know, identify it as an ekphrastic haiku. Perhaps if she capitalized it and uh, italicized it so that you would know that's the title of a piece of work, uh, that would be more helpful. Um, but the title itself uh, was helpful to her. And, that, and I think that that's what her springboard was for that haiku. And mine was sidewalk flowers, admitting I miss Easter Sundays. So both of these haikus sort of conjured a memory for us. For me, it was very different. 
for Teresa, it was, it was an image, right? She looks at this, she can look inside of that painting and she can sort of remember that day. I mean, it's like remembering the sunshine of the day, the flowers of the day, you know, it just takes you right back into a moment. I'm so certain when we look at certain pieces of art, we could climb inside and just remember a, a time in our life or, or an adventure or somewhere or a place or time. But um, that's basically what I, I felt like Teresa was doing with that haiku. For me, it sort of conjured a memory of sidewalk flowers, but then there was this inquiry, right? This inquiry of almost religious faith, right? Do you, have you lost your religious faith? Do you miss your religious faith? What, what, you know, what, what is this? It, so it, 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 it's almost interrogation and problem too, because it's, it's, it's this thought, thought of, you know, what, why, you know, why, why have you stopped this portion of your life? Where did that portion of your life go? And so that's just our response. But at the same time, we had to put this notation. So when these poems, along with many others that were published on Nasher's website, um, were, were, were put up and, 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 go, and went live, uh, we had to, for each different haiku, say responding to Norman Lewis's afternoon, responding to uh, another artist, so that you had that notation there, because they, it, it wasn't always clear that we were writing um, a plastic haiku. So that is what made it clear. It's not hiding. I don't know. Okay. So just a couple examples of uh, a plastic haiku. And, you know, many haiku poets respond to art. So this is, this is nothing new. Um, but there's, there could also be sort of humor, which I love. I love irony and humor in haiku. Uh, I like that light spiritness of it. Um, but this is Open Window, A Sparrow Sings a Pollock by Mike Spikes. And this is not necessarily the Pollock. I, I just gave you that example. But as you know, you can relate to this because for me, I live in a home and adjacent to my house is a bird sanctuary. So there's this group of trees, this huge group of like forest trees that no one touches, but birds are, are extremely loud and they can cause quite a racket. And as much as we think bird song is beautiful, I'm sorry, five o'clock in the morning, not so beautiful, you know, or when you're trying to have a call like I'm trying to have right now, not so beautiful. And they can get very loud. So I understood his frustration here. It was a beautiful image, but I, I totally understand how a racket of birds can, can re be reminiscent of a, of a Jackson Pollock uh, abstract piece of art. Because if you know anything about Pollock, he was, he was very abstract and, and most of his work was ex extremely disturbing, which also matched his personality. Um, blues are the big thing with Monet, she said, spreading the Roquefort. Now, I love this, and this, of course, is the very famous uh, haiku master of contemporary English haiku, Raymond Rosalip. But I love this because of the humor, but also, you, if you know anything about uh, art history, which I was a art major with my undergrad degree, um, Blues, yeah, it's a huge thing. It's a huge thing. Monet is uh, tons and tons of work. It's just everything is just super blue. And so obviously he was a, a lover of day and sky and clouds and all of that. And of course, you know, he is the master of, uh, of hues and, and, and light and able to sort of um, express those in his work. But uh, I, I just love this because of the irony, of the tension, of all of that that, that that you get with haiku, but mainly just the humor. And Ebbing Shore, which is the title of the collection of haiku that I've, I've just recently released, um, comes from this, this ekphrastic haiku. Um, I, I, I've heard people say quite often, I think Mike and Michael, Dylan Welch often says, it's hard to write haiku when you travel. And I don't ever find that to be an issue. If I'm traveling and I see something and it's, 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 it's of interest and it makes me pause, um, I do record 
some sort of haiku. I may go back and, and fix it later or, or chisel it and edit it, but I do record some sort of haiku. And this one was really easy um, to record because of my history as, a, as an art major, I understood, and studying architecture, I understood Philip Freelon, who designed the African-American Art Museum in DC, I understood what he was doing. Um, the design itself is quite beautiful. You start at this bottom, which is a basement, you go all the way down into a basement, and that starts with slavery, and then you come all the way up into contemporary modern times, and that's how the museum is designed. But as you're entering, there's this fountain here, and it just looks like a little, you know, rectangular pool of water. But what it is, it, it actually moves and it shifts. So you hear a sound and the sound sounds like a shore. And that's intentional. Architects are very intentional when, they, when they're designing. And I, it, it was the first thing that caught my eye and, and caught my ear. And everybody else just sort of walked around it. Nobody really, I don't think most people noticed. I know my husband and my children didn't notice it, but I was like, you guys have to understand that that's intentional. He wants it to sound like a shore. He wants us to understand that that's how we came here, that that's how we began in America. And so, although this seems like just an a image, Slave Museum, the Entrance Fountain and Ebbing Shore, um, it's much more than, than just an image. There's much more meaning uh, there. And of course, entrance fountain, but also entrance into the country upon slave ships. So here are a couple more uh, that I wrote. And I wanted to reserve, last time I, I did a presentation like this, there was a lot of question and answers and very uh, rigorous, um, interesting discussion afterwards. And I didn't have uh, time, we didn't have time to do that. So I wanted to leave a good amount of time for that. But um, th these are a couple of, of the, the ekphrastic haiku that are in Ebbing Shore by Horse and Buggy Press. And the first one, slave portrait, unsmiling, she clenches a necklace locket was an extremely hard and difficult um, haiku for me to write. I was in the Charleston Slave Mart, which is a auction house that is the only one in the country that was ever preserved. It's now a, a it was the first, it was the first slave museum, but it's the only one that's preserved. And it was an auction market um, where people came to, to purchase um, enslaved people. And I, if you're interested in that topic at all, I would highly recommend go there beyond any other, you don't have to go to a slave plantation store, go there, that, that's, that's where the crux of most of this is going to be. Um, but there was a portrait of a young slave girl and, and in the portrait, and years ago, you have to understand historically when, when photography first started, almost no one smiled. It was not a thing. People of the, of the 18th and you know, 19th century were very, very serious people. Life was about work, it was about survival, and you didn't get a lot of um, smiling. So it wasn't, that wasn't strange to me that she was not smiling, that, that, that I didn't find strange. But the clinching of the necklace, it was the opposite of a thing, because she's unsmiling, but you know that, they're, that this means something that this is sort of important to her, that it brings her some kind of joy, right? And, and she wants you to understand the significance of it. And moreover, when you think about this, she was a slave. Where did she get this? Where did she get jewelry? If you look at any of the uh, photography of, of the early, you know, this is very early photography of enslaved people, they had extremely tattered clothes on, if, if they had clothes on at all sometimes, um, tattered shoes, where did she get jewelry? That, that was amazing to me. And then more important, what was inside of that locket? The mystery that, um, that was there was just amazing to me. And so I felt very haunted by that image and I, and I needed to record that. So that was the ekphrastic to that uh, particular image. I don't have that image because in that museum, you cannot take photographs. They will ask you to leave. Um, so you, you have to pretty much be there and encounter the image and then record from it. 
The second, um, somebody off, not on mute. The second um, image or the second haiku here is um, sky high steeple, one ground marker for its enslaved builders. Um, and this is so funny. I talked to a colleague who works at the University of Charleston in South Carolina in, in African-American history and um, in the humanities. And he told me, he said, I want, he sent me an address. He said, I want you to just go to this place. I can't meet you because I'll, I'll be out of town at a conference, but I want you to go to this place and you're going to encounter something interesting there. And so he gave me the address to this church. And uh, I said, okay, it's in the midst of downtown. Um, very beautiful church. This picture doesn't do it justice. It's really, really, really high. And um, he said, go there and go to the side of the building. And so you can't actually enter through this, this iron gate here. Um, and the courtyard is very beautiful. It's open, lots of trees, uh, lots of moss hanging, beautiful hanging moss and a beautiful garden there. Um, and so I walked to the side and just as he had indicated, this marker was there. And this marker says, you probably won't be able to say it. It says, uh, in memory of the enslaved workers who helped or who made these bricks and helped build our church, circa 1771 to 1787. And so I thought it was very interesting. This is a Sanskrit, I don't know if you guys know about that, but that's a sort of, um, or, or Sankofa, but um, it's a Sankofa, it's a bird that sort of represents African tradition and culture. But, what I found, found most interesting about this was that it was really little. And this church is really massive, massive. And you would think not only did they build the brick, but they, they obviously, this is labor. They, they built the church and they built the church. They don't own the church. They don't go to the church. They don't attend the church. Uh, it is exclusively a white church in downtown Charleston, South Carolina. But this small marker, which is a homage to the workers uh, and the enslaved people, but I thought, wow, that that's really speaks to the equity or the inequity that that this country has has exhibited all, over all of these years, the racial inequity. Um, so some of those those type of poems. Um, are, are in Ebbingshore. And I believe there's 25 poems in Ebbingshore. There's also a, a nice amount of photography because I took uh, a lot of photos like this when I was um, touring historic slave plantations in different places and museums. So there's a lot of photography too. But um, that's the kind of haiku or, or ekphrastic haiku that you will, you'll find in Ebbingshore. Um, and sometimes it's just happenstance, right? Because I saw at, at the Laura Plantation in uh, Louisiana, I saw a picture of a gentleman. And again, it's just a slave portrait. And you go, most slaves, you know, they're not identified, they don't have names, they're just, they're commodity, they're purchases, they're, they're there for labor, they're like a tool. And so I'm thinking, why is his slave portrait there? And uh, the interesting story behind that was that he was an enslaved person on the Laura Plantation. He decided he was going to join the Civil War as a, uh, as a soldier to fight. And he fought for the Union um, because he obviously was a bit political, even though he was an enslaved person and he wanted uh, the country to sort of end slavery. And he goes off, he fights, the Civil War ends, slavery ends, and he had nowhere to go. There, were, there, there was no money, there was no home, there was no um, you know, benefits or anything that he could access as a, a person who fought in the army. So he returned to the plantation. He literally came back to the plantation and he worked on the plantation until he received at age 60, a military pension. And with that military pension, he left the plantation and he went to live in New Orleans as a free person for 11 more years before he, 
he died. So these are very interesting stories, you know. I mean, it's 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 one of those things. It was it was historic, and it was it was the encounters were very visceral for me as a person who's a descendant of slavery. But at the same time, I mean, the frastics that came out of that, I I just I'm very proud of, and I didn't do a lot of um, publishing of them. Or, or farming them out to different journals to be published because they all sort of work together and they went together. And to stand alone and, and place it in Frog Pond alongside all these other, you know, um, haiku, really, I don't know that, that that would have worked very well. But at any rate, that was my journey with the Frostic Haiku. Yours may be simply to be in a museum. It may be the art in your home or the art that you encounter while you're out. I, could all, I should also say that photography makes um, uh, a wonderful vehicle for uh, ekphrastic uh, poetry. And there's a lot of uh, interesting photography out there right now. If you go to the AP Weekly website like I do and see photography, um, of, the, of the journalists that are recording everything that happens in the news, because everything that happens right now, you have photos, you know, you don't need the commentary so much, you know, you have the information, the commentary is neither here nor there, it's all, you know, whatever side someone's on, but the photographs speak volumes, because photographs don't lie, they tell a story, and so they're really wonderful for me to, to respond to uh, as well. But what I would like to do at this point, what are we at 11.35? Um, I think you guys have been looking at this image a lot because it's part of the design of this package. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to write an ekphrastic this morning, open up the, the conference for today with a haiku, if you so choose. So uh, this is part of the design and I thought this was a beautiful design because Often I like to take night walks when I'm at the ocean or sunset walks. And it's just my favorite time to experience the ocean because it's so quiet and the day is gone. There's a calmness. But also when I'm at the ocean, I understand as beautiful as it is, it can be uh, very dark. You have to respect the sea. The, the, the ocean is um, a very haunting place sometimes, if you will. So keeping in mind that that darkness and that that obvious you know that beauty i want to give you just a few minutes to write an ekphrastic to this photo
Okay, they're, they're starting to share. Um, you guys are starting to share some. Um, I think you're all on mute, so I'll, I'll go ahead and read a couple of them since you are on mute. Brian Cook, the jade around her neck tsunami. Roberta Berry, wave after wave, swimming in the blues, you left me. Margie, dark ocean, carrying ships filled with slaves. And that's Katie or Kat, I think it's Kati, not Katie, Kati Moore. Um, second wave, some steps back towards mainland. And Barry, Bari, Levine, Blue Horizon, the level water seeks. I like that, that's very nice. Nick, thought waves, rain on my head tells me to be here. And Peter Larson, moon at my shoulder, greases the scenarios of tidal might. All right. Nice. Oh, I love Deborah's ebb and flow of my fear, dark ocean. So I'm glad we were able to start the conference today with some haiku. Do you guys have any questions? Crystal, I think, uh, is it Dana Grover? You have your hand up. Did you have a question for Crystal? Uh, is everybody muted or no? Uh, you know, my hand up, uh, I don't know how that happened. I don't really <laughs> okay. have my hand up. Okay, no worries. <laughs> yeah, they can unmute. I have a question. Yeah. Um, if um, I, I, I posted this on, on, on the chat, but perhaps you can expand uh, on this. Um, you know, when going to a museum or seeing some piece of architecture or an artifact, you know, th that is, is on display. Somebody else has recognized it as you know, having some artistic value. But if you're just writing about a friend's photo or, or a, a friend's painting, nobody famous. Now, is this just another haiku or what, could you say this is a nephrastic uh, haiku? That is an interesting question. Um, that I guess that sort of speaks to the value of art or, or is it art or is it just, you know, um, I don't know if I consider a friend's photograph art, maybe if they're a photographer or they're a famous photographer. Um, and I guess it is all art in some way. But when I think about plastic, I think that we're talking about art in the world that's sort of uh, maybe recognized by somebody else. Recognized and viewed universally and recognized. Um, that's how I, I think about ekphrastic and that, that could be, that could be wrong. I'm not sure. I know Michael's on, on here. He could maybe speak better to that, but um, I don't know. I, I would say, you know, when I look at Gideon Young's photograph uh, on um, the cover of his haiku book, my hands full of light, and it's his daughter's handprint. Um, if you guys have encountered that book from backbone press, um, I think about, is, is he writing a frastic haiku when he's writing in response to his daughter's um, handprint, you know, the paint print of, of her hand. Um, maybe there, there's something when I talked about the notation in which we, we give the, the, the reason or the sort of context in which we've written the ekphrastic. Maybe that notation sort of speaks to whether it's ekphrastic or not. Because when I looked at that piece, I, I felt like Gideon in many ways was, was writing an ekphrastic haiku, but I don't know that that's, I think if, if we're talking universally, then <clears throat> a friend's sketch 
that you're responding to may, may not necessarily, you know. Okay. I, I think, again, I, I think it uh, comes down to the question of uh, who decides art is art. Mm-hmm. You know, is, is, is it an individual person or is it a group, a committee, a consensus of many individual people? Well, when we're in the humanities, you know, we talk about discussion can go way on forever, so I won't take that for any more. Yeah, and I just, I just wanted to say, we work in the humanities. We work in uh, interdiscipl- interdisciplinary all the time. So, like today, after I finish this, I'm a poet who's going to the Durham Symphony Orchestra, who's there uh, doing a whole uh, concert on Harlem Renaissance. Uh, work jazz, and then I'm going to be in, in doing poetry during the intermissions. And so I think uh, oftentimes there is this sort of interdisciplinary, um, you know, collaborations that happen, but it's usually recognized, right? So it's like if an if a poet is responding to a piece of art, those things go hand in hand. You you may want to know who the poet is, and you may also want to know who the who the artist is. Not necessarily, you know, I'm writing about um, a photo that I saw or whatever, that the two, the two merge together. The one artist is responding to another. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Krista, where can we find your book? Oh, um, if, if, if C will type it in the chat, it's just crystalsimonesmith.com. Great. Thank you. Hi, Crystal. Yes. It's Frank Higgins here. By a, an extraordinary coincidence, uh, I was in Charleston in March with a play. It was right around, the theater was right around the corner from the slave mart. So mm-hmm. your haiku uh, slave portrait, uh, I've seen that, maybe that's what they put it on the website or something, but I've seen the, hi- I've seen the photo of which, uh, I mean, just a couple months ago that you wrote this. So I think your work is terrific. Uh, so I just wanted to, to give a fan note, uh, but it's also, it's so, it's um, it's locked into the kinds of things that interest me the most in terms of uh, a haiku response to art, but also to architecture, well, art, but, but to the things around us. So uh, I'll grab your book and I will talk you up to everyone I know. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of history in architecture. There's a lot of story in architecture. It was when I was an art major and, and studying art history, that that form, that that genre was 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 the one that, that resonated with me most. So yeah, I, I like writing in response to architecture. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm surprised you saw that slave portrait because you know, they, they may have been using that for marketing purposes, but most of the things in there, they, they don't allow you to take photos of. Right, right. But, but I mean, I, I was in the museum, so. You were in the museum, so you saw, oh, I got you, so you encountered it yourself. Gotcha. I encountered it, right. Yes. Um, yes. And it's an amazing thing. Uh, I mean, you, you're right, it's the only pres- preserved museum there. Um, when you walk around, there, there are some signs out on the streets where, this is the corner where they used to sell slaves. And that's all there is, is just a little marker out of, you know, on a street corner. But the Slave Mart Museum, um, it's unique. Yeah, so. yeah and, and it's where I encountered the most difficult pieces because some of, some of the pieces and, and things that they preserved there were really, really difficult to read and, and comprehend and step into that time and that mindset. And so I could see why they wanted, you know, want you to have that experience in the museum instead of seeing photographs mm-hmm. of it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. We have about two minutes left. Are there other questions or comments for Crystal? Well, I, I, I have another comment. Uh, I, I do a lot of uh, frastic Haiku, well, mostly Hayabun. And um, most of the ones I have are being inspired or moved by music. I find music um, 
something that uh, speaks to me. Certain pieces speak to me in a certain way, bring back a, a memory or a feeling or put me in a mood. Uh, I don't read much other work by, by um, poets who, who have been inspired by music. Uh, a couple of pieces that I wrote, the, the editor said, well, I'd never heard of this music before. And he, he discovered a new piece to enjoy. So I would like to see um, or, and read some um, works that have been inspired by uh, some music. Maybe that's, that's something you could do, <laughs> Crystal? You know, I don't know. When I write free verse, music often steps in. Uh, it, it finds its way into my free verse a lot because obviously as poets, we, we are musical, we are lyrical. And so we're... I, I, most of the poets I know really enjoy music. So, so it, it does find our way, it, its way into our, our work, um, not necessarily responding to it, but just, you know, uh, in the details uh, of the poem and the metaphor. But um, I've not seen a lot of that in, and maybe if we do have some scholars on, on, on the call, I've not seen a lot of that in, in haiku. Um, but yeah, that, that would be something very interesting to explore. Maybe you will explore it <laughs> with your high boom. <laughs> and you could just, you know, the notations are very helpful, even if it's a piece, pieces that we don't know or new pieces or things that people are, are unfamiliar with, the notations are very helpful to, to make us aware of, of the music that you're responding to. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks everyone. Um, we're at time, Crystal, really excellent presentation. Thank you so much. And I'm sure you probably haven't been able to see the chat has just filled up with thank yous and appreciative comments. Um, so you might wanna take a scroll through there. And um, then our next presentation in about 10 minutes will be Caroline Scanna, uh, how to evaluate our own haiku. And that will be moderated by Antoinette Chung. So stick around. Guys, I'm getting a few messages, so I'm going to put that that in there again. The ordering information for Ebbing Shore. I'll put it in the chat again.
This is really awkward. Feel free to talk to each other or to talk to Crystal if you don't want to. This space doesn't have to be silent. Hey, Crystal. Um, this is Nick from uh, Washington. Um, are you interested in uh, Kaismir Malevich uh, work, uh, like uh, his uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian Russian work? Have you seen that? I've not, but somebody did um, send me some information about that, and I, I've I've been writing different books in, in different genres of poetry, so I have not had time to investigate, but I am interested. Yeah. Still yeah, yeah, I, I will, I will, I, I am interested in that because yeah, I, especially with the, the, the situation with the Ukraine war. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> like an art, uh, there's also kind of an invasion too, because like, uh, a lot of Russian uh, museums and uh, Russian nationalists will claim Malevich as Russian, but then the Ukrainians will say he's Ukrainian. <laughs> so it's like, and then Russia it really does speak to speak to what is happening because that's exactly the way Russia feels is that they are Russian. <laughs> yeah, they they kind of claim like all post-Soviet <clears throat> art is kind of like Russian art. Um, and I actually think, I think Malevich himself said in an interview that he's Ukrainian, but he's like, he said he's, he has like three nationalities, um, but he primarily sees himself as Ukrainian. But um, I don't know how Russia gets around that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, uh, Russia mostly has his art though. Like they have it in their museums. Ukraine has, I think, very little. Um, they all have his his main works. Russia has his main works. But I'm in, I'm really inspired by his work. I this morning I was trying to write a haiku on his most famous works, but very difficult because they're very like abstract. And I'm trying to write something like tangible about a really abstract painting. But I saw in the comments somebody said that Jackson Pollock's work was um, calming in some way to them. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> It does work. It does work uh, because he has such an interesting and unique um, style. It was probably the most one of the most unique styles in in contemporary art. But I don't know if I ever found it calming. <laughs> Someone has a hand up. I have. Okay. Maxi Amberger. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm just wondering how you might balance the distinction between ekphrastic haiku. And Haiga. Hmm. I don't know. You know, um, when I when I put when I when I write of an art piece in a free verse poem, um, I don't know. For me, a, a Haiga is usually telling a story, right? It's usually a narrative because that's what a prose poem is, right? It tells us a story. It's it's rare that you're going to find. A, I don't find very many haiga abstract at all. Um, you got concrete images in there. You, you basically have a narrative and a story, and then it ends with that paired haiku. So uh, no, no, hi. Oh, oh haiga. I'm sorry. I thought you said hi boom. I'm so sorry. I thought you said hi boom. Um, no, I don't think that those are the same. I mean, I uh, to be honest. No, but the yeah. question was, how do you balance your distinction? Huh. So it's the opposite of a thing for me, because I, for me, the haiku has to come first and the visual artist is responding to the haiku. So it's, it's, it's a different thing. So that's when you look at Ian, um, I can't think of Ian's last name, but Ian does a whole bunch of, of haiga. He's responding to, to, so it's the opposite of a thing. So um, I, I, you know, Ekphrastic haiku and, and haiga, those are sort of two different things, right? That, 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 that's the way I just feel like it's the opposite of a thing, that the visual artist is responding to the haiku as opposed to the, the, the you know, writing a response to the art. I, I'm not sure that's true. I, I, that certainly isn't for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and quite also, often so you it is a collaboration. So, so, oh, no, no, I know it's not a collaboration. So 
for me, when I think of Haiga and I've, I've created Haiga, I don't create the art first. I, cre- I, I write in response to a haiku. But if you're, if you're absolutely saying that you create the visual first and then you write the haiku, maybe that's... Both ways. Both yeah. ways. Okay. Regardless, well, that's sort, of the, sort of the way I do it. I'm, uh, the haiga becomes a piece in and of itself. Right. Both, I write an image regardless of what... I went, I went and started fact, all the, this. The poetry is a response. Oops. I went started all this and now I have to shut it down. Sorry. We have to move on.